pleasure to have this opportunity. I still, when I, I've done quite a few events over the lockdown period. And yeah, I still, before they begin, I still imagine there's a bunch of people in a room somewhere waiting to hear a talk, but it's, uh, it's, it's getting more and more strange to have not been on a stage for as long as it's been now. Uh, but it's lovely to see just how many people come along to these online events. And I think in many ways, for me as an attendee of events as well, it's been really gratifying to be able to attend things that actually with face-to-face, -face, it's often impossible. And, um, and it has been a very strange period for me, certainly in terms of the professional aspect of what I do. So much of our academic calendar is taken up with a whole range of activities where we engage the public on the science that we do. I'm responsible for a number of programs of work, partnerships with institutions who want to reach out to the public that most of what we've would typically do kind of went out the window to the point where it's incredibly worrying, of course. And I think in many respects, that's what frames this title, uh, the science communication crisis, because I do think we are at a, at a really sort of strange time in thinking about our role and relationship with the wider public. I sit on various uh, grant awarding bodies who fund research for public engagement and science communication activity. And I think what we've seen over this sort of 10 year period really is progressive integration of digital experiences within that science communication work, but actually greater preoccupation with the, the mode of interacting with people through those environments. And, and some of you I'm sure will have watched the, the recent Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, which um, for me is, is a wonderful way of, of, a wonderful piece of science communication, first of all. It's amazing how many LinkedIn messages I've seen from people that you would imagine to already know this stuff, who have said, wow, I just couldn't imagine this was happening and what was laying behind these platforms. So it's a strange kind of disjunction between, on the one hand, my advocacy of digital environments that I think is crucial and necessary, but at the same time, realizing that it comes with a whole range of consequences and contradictions that I think we need to wrestle with as a community to the point where it's really difficult to know how to think about engaging people online at this point in time. And I'll talk about some of the research I've been doing with the platform TikTok and looking at COVID messaging as I go through that. But it's useful to have this in mind, not least because I would imagine that most of you here uh, do not have TikTok accounts and uh, may have some awareness of what it is, but perhaps not too much and you probably haven't used it. But of course, it's been over the last year, the sort of single platform that many young people are now using to communicate. It's gone beyond Instagram into these, these, these new environments. So I think it's helpful to think about that because it reminds us that we are persistently kind of out of touch with what a particular generation is engaging with. And I feel this very strongly in the context of my students at university this year, many of whom you would think coming into university at the age of 18, having grown up with iPads essentially and mobile phones, you would think these are kind of digitally native, that this is an incredibly seamless transition from face-to-face -face into a kind of online learning, but actually it's not. It's incredibly diverse, the range of competencies that we see. And indeed, more particularly, the degree of literacy that you see. Most of the students that we talk to don't have a really sophisticated sense of, of, of the issues that lie behind the social dilemma as a documentary. This idea that everything they're doing is being tracked, that it affects their own pathway through information, and that they may exist within these kind of filter bubbles that, that either limit how much they see or simply reflect back their own particular view of the world. So this presents a number of challenges, I think, for us as a community of, of people that are concerned with communicating knowledge, really. And it's not just science, it's all kinds of knowledge across all sorts of disciplines, where we think that all we needed to do was really just engage with the public, share, find more opportunities to share more and more of what we do with more and more of the public. But actually, it's clear that some of these things are just not working. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there's still a limited amount of imagination that sits alongside these act activities. We, in, in science communication, we, we talk about a deficit model, which a concept you may have heard of, where we sort of think about the role of the scientist is to impart knowledge onto the sort of public who don't have it. And this model is very much being criticized as a kind of failure to really understand what the public have as their sort of own assets culturally, intellectually, uh, that they bring to the table. And it creates a very didactic sort of one-way system and flow of information. So this principle that in fact, we need to reconfigure that relationship is really at the heart of what I'd like to say today. 
because it seems to me one of the things we've learned over the sort of COVID period is that we know that the science isn't enough. Uh, probably arguably since I guess uh, the Trump administration where there's been a lot of discussion about fake news and uh, misinformation and alternative facts. These concepts entered the public domain over that period, but still now have become kind of uh, essential components of, of what we're wrestling with to get information, credible information out there. So, so how do we deal with it? How do we make sure that we can both manage the pathways to credible knowledge for a range of publics, but also understand how to have an impact on people in a way that really makes any difference in their life. And I, I guess I've always thought that um, the science isn't enough. And I think COVID has, has taught us that where there is such a, a, a kind of a cacophony of, of ways in which science facts are being presented, that it's clear that to, to most people that many of the science facts are being marshaled by political interests in a way that almost entirely undermines the science itself. And yet we as scientists sort of scratch our heads and think, well, we know these are facts, so why are they not simply following these guidelines and this evidence? And, and I think it's partly because we, we need as a community to understand the way in which our science is made sense of by a range of political actors. And, and that includes the public in this, because as agents of trying to marshal information, we have to understand their environments. And I'll give you one simple example of this. Um, it's apparent to, I learned this statistic from a, a librarian a couple of years ago, that students at university these days, um, they will print out only 1% of the articles that they read. So we have to assume that most of what students are doing is engaging with content digitally and not only that, but they're engaging with it on their mobile device. Now, I'm sure everyone here will have read a PDF on a mobile device and it isn't terribly good. It's not really built for that purpose. So the behavior that surrounds the consumption of our content, of our science, is so very different from what it was even, even five years ago, I would say, that the entire fabric of, of how we engage and share what we do needs a complete overhaul. At the same time, we need to be much more aware of how the science that we try to articulate exists within a social and political context, which will affect our capacity to even reach people with the fundamentals of those scientific insights. Um, I think in many respects, one of the failures of science communication has been the, the failure to recognize how easy it is to, for, 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 political actors, and I use that term very broadly from, from people working in industry, from people working in politics, um, everyone that let's say arguably is outside of science to simply pick and choose the facts that they want to present the perspective that they wish to advance. And that's always been the case. But I think what we haven't done as well is to really address the impact of that on how we approach our science communication work, which sort of leads me to the, the kind of gist of what I want to talk about today, which is that, that simply saying follow the science isn't enough if we hope to have an impact. And I always think about um, my own science communication activities and imagine the, the, the sort of general public or even just the, 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 the people that are close to me and how much time they have to actually engage uh, with, with what I do, you know, my family members, don't read my articles, they don't listen to my podcast, they don't do anything that connects with what I do. And, and I think it's partly because we only have so much time in the day to actually reach the public. And that's quite, uh, it really focuses the mind to, to realize that if you were to, if your mission is to communicate science, and you really drill down into what are the moments in which you can actually do that over the course of somebody's day, it's a very small window. And I think coming to terms with that and what that involves is really crucial because it's quite likely that that window also is probably somebody on a train home or on a commute on their mobile phone looking at something through Facebook. That may be your window. Even the era of the documentary is becoming increasingly narrow as a, as a sort of frame in which you can reach people. So some of these conventions and aspirations that we had 20 years ago to communicate our science are no longer in place. I think at the same time, we also have to deal with the fact that the, there's a blurring of channels of communication uh, that has become quite profound over the last uh, 10 years with the rise of social media. And to give you one example of this, here is a, an image of the world's first telephone tooth implant. And you can kind of see how it looks. You've got the chip inside it. So when you have a cavity and you need to have a tooth replacement, 
you can simply choose the gold, silver, or the uh, telephone tooth implants. And this was designed by a couple of uh, designers from uh, London uh, about over 10 years ago. And, um, and they, it was a really compelling project and they took it to a technology fair and, and, uh, and spoke to journalists about it. And, and when asked by the journalist, when, when is this coming out? Uh, they said, well, we're, we're just artists. We're not actually commercializing this product. It's never going to come out. And nobody wrote about it. There was no coverage about it at all. So instead, they the following year took it to another technology fair. And when asked the same question about when this device is going to be available, they said it will be out in six months. And with that, they made the cover of Time magazine, which you can see well, just about here. So the point of this is really to recognize that we live in a very blurry world in terms of our consumption and engagement with media content, where the boundaries between factual information, news, science, entertainment, spoofs even, and, um, and, and, and all, are all kind of blurred, are all mixed in together. And I think this has a really big impact on our capacity to disaggregate these types of channels and, and feeds of content. But it reminds me also that we need to completely rethink our relationship with the public domain. Um, and I think to do that, we need much more imaginative ways in which we think about the creation of content and imagine those behaviors that surround the consumption of our content um, without really understanding that, without understanding what are those experiences like for people and where do we have an opportunity to connect with people where we fail to really address and, and, and create content that's suitable for those environments. And I mentioned TikTok earlier, partly because it has become a platform that is really representing the sort of cutting edge of, of creative content uh, in the last probably year or two. But certainly over the last year, there's been a lot of attention around this. You might have seen discussions about whether TikTok will be banned in the US for a whole range of reasons. And I think it's partly because also there's a very young population of users within this that it raises questions about governance and and I had a friend uh, who's 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 uh, in my uh, a parent of a friend in my in my child's class, who um, who was concerned about their own child's use of this platform, and it became apparent. And in other conversations I have with people as well, that in fact most parents don't really understand what's going on within these environments. They don't know how they work. They don't even know that in some situations, including this one. Uh, the, the only way in which a child should have access to it is under the supervision of a parental account. So many of the ways in which um, it's possible to safeguard the experience of young people are in fact completely unknown to the users and guardians around them. But what's interesting with TikTok over this period has been uh, the way in which it's tried to manage COVID messaging. So some of the research I've been doing has been looking at how TikTok in particular, which has a whole program around TikTok for good, this idea that the platform can communicate science and communicate in important information that people need to hear. So we've been looking at TikTok for six months to see what it's done with COVID. And then when you log into the app um, over the last six months, you would always see a button that says COVID-19 and you can press that button and it takes you through to a whole range of resources and videos about COVID. Um, it also articulates a range of partnerships that have been held with it, for, working especially with the WHO, uh, but also a, a whole range of international organizations like the United Nations. So there's, a, there's been a filter of COVID content that's been presented within the platform. And yet the really the troubling thing about it is, and this is not quite published research yet, but the data is pretty clear, is that this information hasn't been updated for nearly six months now. The information that's available within the platform and the guidance that's offered is based on advice from March 2020. So there's a real challenge with how these platforms are interfacing with a whole range of kind of public needs and public concerns that is still yet unresolved. And I think one of the things that is really interesting is a couple of years ago, um, the CEO of NHS England, Simon Stevens, argued on behalf of a, a need for social media companies to make more of a contribution to healthcare because of the impact that these platforms have on people's lives. And I think that impact is is certainly apparent in the context of COVID messaging, but also more broadly in the context of how we share science and science facts. But certainly if you want to have an impact as a science communicator and you can really figure out how to make really good TikTok content, the impact and reach you would have to young audiences especially is huge. And this sort of draws me sort of closer to the, the broader parts of what I want to talk about, which is what we've tried to do at Salford 
to address this problem over the last few years. So I've been at Salford University in this position for just, about, just over six years now. And um, it was apparent at the time that the university was keen to sort of develop a creative approach to science communication. But for many institutions, and I think Salford was, was similar, it's quite a conventional approach to thinking through these problems. So the fact that we need to do things like train our staff to be uh, to be com comfortable, comfortable and confident within the media, to get our academics working more closely with journalists. These are all quite standard uh, approaches to interfacing with the media. The majority of staff at Salford, and certainly I would say in the sector more widely, is that nearly, I, I would say probably 10, 15% of the science staff would have any kind of significant online presence. Most people don't have a YouTube, not even not so much a YouTube channel, but not even a YouTube video about what they're doing. So there's a really long way to go uh, before we can get to a point where people are even visible enough to reach the public or even be aware of, uh, for the public to be aware of them. I mean, I um, one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to think about their public presence, because even if you have a website or a Twitter account that's followed by just a few people. All it takes is one TV producer, one radio editor to find you online through your expertise. And you've got then an opportunity for them to reach out to you uh, and interview you or engage you on, on your work. So these sorts of aspects of our public persona are already crucial, but they're still only a small part of how we think about that dialogue with the public. Um, so what we did a few years ago was to take a relationship that we had as an institution for many years with the Manchester Science Festival and really think about how we could innovate creatively with that contribution. And to do so, we created an event, which hopefully you can see here, it's called Game Lab, which became a, a program of work that was designed for a, few, a variety of reasons. Um, of course, one aspect was to share our research with the public. Um, which in itself wasn't just a simple sort of objective, uh, because in fact, a lot of the science communication work that people do at festivals is not necessarily about sharing the research, it's about sharing science. So you go to a science festival, you see lots of interesting experiments, but they're not always intimately connected to the cutting edge research of those, of those scientists. So we tried to bring one of our operating principles for public engagement activity to always be driven by the research activity that we're doing so that we don't present sort of science that's completed, but we present science kind of in progress, which is a risky thing to do because of course, anyone working in science knows that you kind of want to make sure it's all finished before you share your findings. But what I've seen over the last few years is a growing expectation for the public to be involved in the creation of science before it gets to that point. We call this within science communication, we call this upstream engagement. So the critique, um, I think it was um, Mark uh, Walport, the former science uh, uh, chief scientist, that, that said that sort of good science ends with communication. But in my mind, a good science begins with communication, that if you don't have that dialogue with the public at all stages in the creation of the work, then you lose sight of its, its not just its relevance within society, but the opportunity to engage and mobilize a whole range of other people who may be able to contribute to its development. We see this kind of methodology operating in the context of citizen science, which you will have likely all heard about. And it's not just interesting from a resource perspective. Certainly, yes, if you can get a few hundred people collecting data for you that is hopefully increasing the speed at which you can make discoveries, that's amazing. But the real legacy of it is that growing nurturing of science capital across the lifetime of citizens that is, that is what's most important. In my mind, it's not important that we all understand the intricacies of COVID-19. What's really important is we all get behind the idea that science is the crucial way in which we should think about the problem. And I think in order to get to that point, you have to have those regular moments across somebody's life where they feel that science matters and where they understand the values behind it and the approaches taken. So to get to this situation, we created Game Lab as a way of people trying to experience a whole range of other ways of encountering scientists. And uh, so we're within our Media City building in Salford University, we put together four floors of immersive experiences that brought people partly through technology, partly through just having conversations 
uh, into understanding the complexities of science. And at the heart of it was this kind of immersive dialogue that took place around it. So we'd have we'd have a whole sort of program of work that brought gaming and science discovery together to engage people. And I think it's, it's a, a nice methodology because you know, one of the things, if you, if you get people playing a game, first of all, you get them kind of already enthusiastic and having a kind of joyful experience, but you also have their, their 100% of their attention. It's very hard to get distracted by your mobile phone or by something else when you're playing a game. So we thought Game Lab as a way of trying to engage people was an effective approach to thinking about that dialogue. But it was also important for us because it was a vehicle for collaboration internally. And this is perhaps the other sort of core pillar of what we were trying to create and not just a place where we could reach out to the public and engage them on our science but where there would be this kind of internal collaboration that would surround it and we we created a range of sort of interesting experiences that manifest this idea so this is one called the microbiome which worked with a number of scientists in the in the school but also a range of artists to create what essentially was quite a, a sort of immersive um mixed media experience so you'd enter this space and you'd engage with the projections you could interact with the wall in various ways and you could also try out virtual reality simulations and so on and um, as, as a kind of producer of this activity it was certainly interesting to see how the public reacted to it but the bigger legacy in my mind uh, is how is the collaboration that it brought together so these relationships that took place in the creation of this experience uh, are still very much in place and continue in new iterations with new funding and certainly new ways of thinking about that dialogue with the public. It gets people considering the examples like the difference between setting up an installation at a festival for a couple of days versus creating a virtual reality experience that anyone can download for free. And it's that kind of dialogue about what it is we think we're doing and why that is again really what's interesting about it. So the, the events are a vehicle for something much more than just the communication of science. Um, we've also tried to innovate a little bit with um, engineering as well. So one of the things we've, we've done is, is to create um, events which allow a sort of cross-generational conversation about the future and about scientific discovery. So one of the one of the problems I think with science festivals is often if you have a, an event that brings families along, they often involve the kids doing something and the parents kind of on the sidelines not doing very much. So a couple of years ago, we worked with the ESRC Festival of Social Science to produce, I'm gonna go over myself here, <laughs> to produce an event that was uh, essentially about the future of robotics and trying to imagine what that future was like. But instead of getting just the uh, the children involved and engaged with the science, we wanted to create a cross-generational dialogue about this future. So we sat people down in, in sort of tables, families would get together and, and, and they would try to make a robot. But what was really important for us was about the conversation between the people within those families about the future. So we tried to foster this kind of cross-generational conversation. And there's quite a lot of, of sort of... Um, insight that comes out of the methods within social science that underpin this event. So we know that from a range of creative techniques within social science research, that if you get people making stuff, then it creates a different kind of learning experience. It, it embeds it much deeper, but also uh, really initiates different types of conversations. So by having families working together to build something, rather than saying this was a children's activity, we kind of tried to allow for this to happen in, in quite an organic way. Another event that was really unusual as well, and uh, for me it was inspired by an experience I had about 20 years ago, where I went to uh, a place called the Tramway Theatre in Glasgow, which was at the time showing an event, a theatre production called A Brief History of Time, which was inspired by Stephen Hawking's book. And if you imagine it, the tramway, as the name suggests, is an enormous venue that was previously used for repairing trams. So huge spaces and wonderful space in which you can create the great theatre. Um, well, for this production, they could only show it to 12 people at a time. So we kind of walked in and thought, well, this is strange already. You've got 12 people out of the audience. It's a big sort of evening event and only 12 tickets could be sold. 
And the way it worked is you entered the venue and immediately when you entered the venue, you were part of the production. So it wasn't that you sort of milled about and just had a drink. You were already in it as soon as you entered the door. And then the actors who were there sort of as staff would then lead you through different scenarios, which represented different chapters of the book. Um, endeavoring to communicate aspects of the universe, the cosmos and so on, the aspects of that underpinned the science of, of Hawking's book. And what was really amazing was that they managed to create for these 12 people, myself included, I guess, a really memorable experience about the science behind that book that you know, still, as you can tell, lives with me today. And it made me think about how often we, as communicators, the, the goal is to sort of reach as many people as possible and for that to be sort of expressed as impact. But actually it's the deeper impacts with smaller groups of people that can often be the most long lasting and, and most enriching. So a few years ago, again, as part of Manchester Science Festival, we created an event called Amarance, which was designed to see if we could get people to fall in love as a kind of scientific experiment. Now the caveat is of course, that we weren't really professing it was a proper science experiment, but it was presented as a science experiment of a, of a kind. So we, for, with the, for the promotion of around the event, we invited people to come along to an evening, spend an evening with us and see if they could fall in love. And um, we wanted to avoid the problem of what happens if you've got two people that don't know each other, it's like a blind date, how's that going to work? So we encourage people to come either in a couple that they're already sort of newly formed or indeed in a relationship that's long lasting and they want to rediscover each other's uh, feelings for, for one another. But over the evening, we sat them through a whole range of experiences from having what you can see here as these were love potions. So we had a barista creating love potions. We had a, a menu, which I can show you, which was sort of informed by the, the science of, of sort of nutrition that is known to be associated with developing feelings of affection or, or attachment or arousal. And over sort of three hours, we, we put the audience of which there were probably 40 people through a whole range of experiences that we hoped would not only sort of prove that we can get them to fall in love. And we ran a sort of science experiment alongside this where after every course of the meal, they had to assess how close they felt to the person they were with. And then we'd reflect on it and see whether in fact they've got closer over the evening, which they had. And it was, uh, so it's it sort of fun and interesting from that side of it. But the key thing for us was about this depth of a relationship by spending time with people. And, um, now, it reminds me of a performance artist called Marina Abramovich, who is renowned for all sorts of work as a performance artist. But a few years ago, I think it was at the MoMA in New York, created a piece, a piece called The Artist is Present. And for those, that, those people that don't really like performance art, it can sound really annoying as an experience. But if you imagine it, it involved audiences queuing up to spend 10 minutes sitting opposite the artist, just looking into their eyes. And what was really interesting about it was it provided this space in which people could just be still for 10 minutes, not doing anything, looking at another person. And I think in a world where we are so surrounded by distractions, that that's really what that's that's really why it resonates. And people were queuing for this, you know, all around the block around in New York. So it was a really a successful event but very simple as well. And it sort of resonates with the idea that we are anxious about how much time we're spending in digital space, anxious about the way in which we have so many factors pulling us in lots of different directions. And, and that that has a really big impact on how we think about the world. So trying to disrupt some of these conventions, some of these behaviors that may in fact be quite limiting is really important uh, as a science communicator to know how we can interrupt people. There's a great example also from Manchester Science Festival where they produced a, a, an installation on the science of sleeping, where in the Manchester Arndale Centre, they set up sleeping pods where you could just have a nap for a couple of hours uh, during your shopping day, which of course, anyone that's been around the Arndale Centre will know that's quite welcome at some point in the day. So bringing the science into a different terrain, disrupting some of the conventions that operate around that is a big part of what we've done. Um, and this includes working with a project that was called Science in the House with Rob Appleby, who I know works down at Daresbury from time to time. And we wanted to see how we could explore bringing immersive experiences into a music festival. And with this event, Rob and uh, James, his collaborator, managed to create essentially a gig within the music programme of the festival, not the science programme. 
that allowed people to engage with the science of the work that Rob is doing, but through the experience of, of the kind of activity that happens at the festival outside the science program. So you could come along, see the visuals, hear the music and dance. And I think that again is, is a good example of how we see this sort of disruptive approach to science communication. We need to break down some of those conventions that underpin much of what we do as science communicators and indeed much of the expectations we have of audiences into something that's radically different. And you know, inevitably, these are experiments. Uh, I think we had about 60 or so people come along. It looks quite busy in this video, but over the course of the set, it probably would be about 100 or 200 people, but you know, it wasn't a, a 6,000 venue, person venue. But, uh, and the Amaranth event, you know, we had 40 people. We worked out that financially, it probably cost us about 100 quid a head to produce. And we were getting a ticket of probably 15 pounds per person. But the legacy of it is this creative experimental community that's critically trying to advance the practice of science communication. And whilst you might look at the finance of this and think, gosh, that was a big waste of money. We didn't reach anybody. I think for me, as the producer, I guess, of it, um, when you look at what all those people involved have gone on to do, it's really mind blowing. There's so much, so many spin off legacies to these creative experiments, which are, you know, often financially quite, quite fragile situations. But I guess I was, I remember uh, having a Nesta grant a few years ago where over the sessions that we had with the sort of uh, funding team, there was so much encouragement to fail, <laughs> which um, obviously it seems a bit strange, but actually we wanted to make sure that people didn't lower their ambitions and go with safe options uh, that lead them to, again, no real attempt to disrupt or problematize this relationship between science and the public. And that's really at the heart of, of everything I'm saying here which is that the crisis we find ourselves in is where there's increasing drive to being quite conventional with science communication work, to have more sort of conventional festival activities, more family events, things that sort of fulfill a particular notion of science communication that unfortunately doesn't do the kind of work that we want it to do as citizens. Um, and so if we don't get out of, it, out of this mode into something very different, then we limit how much we can really expect to achieve to either inspire or inform the public that come along to this. Um, and what's really been very rewarding over the period at Salford has been the range of aspects of the institution that have got involved. So this is one of our, uh, again, relatively recent uh, installations called the Library of Fake News. And this is um, a production that was led by the university library. Now, historically that's unheard of I think not just for Salford, but for universities, often the libraries aren't involved with science communication activities. But of course, in a world where we are so anxious about how information is found, how it's archived, how it's given sort of legitimacy, that to involve the library at, at the start with this production was, was considered to be really important. And now the library has its own team of people that is sort of engaged with how they bring knowledge to not just our student audience and public, but also the wider public. So we've set up things like, or rather they've set up things like living libraries where um, academic staff would be in the library having conversations about books they've written uh, with whoever wants to come along. And, um, and for me, what's really exciting about that is that by bringing in more people to think about this problem of communicating science to the public, you have so many more ideas, so many, such a wider range of, of thoughts about how to do this well, and a whole different context of perspectives that, that are brought into that mix as well. For all the, all the will in the world, there's only so far academics can go in their appreciation for what we need to do as science communicators. So to bring in that wider community of, of uh, intellectuals, of creators, of people that are uh, concerned about and care about the, the public and social world in which we live, this has been incredibly rewarding. So with that in mind, the crisis, uh, just to sort of begin to wrap up a little bit, the crisis that I decided, I tried to be quite optimistic in everything I do, and I think there is a lot of, of, of positivity in, in what's happened with science communication over the last 20 years. There is probably far more science communication happening today than ever before but there's also far more competition uh, for people's attention. We live in an, an attention economy. This is uh, another sort of 
insight from the social dilemma, the, the Netflix documentary sort of reminds us that we are constantly competing for people's attention to make sure that we can reach them with something about what we do. And if we don't understand their habits, their behaviors, their expectations, or even their inclinations, we fail to reach them. You may notice I, one of the things I do every day is multiple times look at the BBC News app. And you might have seen within the BBC News app over the last year that for many stories, they don't even have a full article. They just have bullet points. It's, it's kind of cr cringy to think that bullet points have a function still in this world. But here we have a realization that people don't have time or don't make time to read everything in full. Um, so we live in a bullet pointed society and coming to terms with the fact that if you don't make a video that's able to hit somebody or reach somebody within 15 seconds, you lose them. These sorts of things are essential to understand and appreciate if you want to really reach people. So um, I think we've got about 20 minutes uh, left before we wrap up. So I'm very keen to, I see a number of questions coming up already. So I'm very happy to now take some questions. Claire, if you're still there. Yeah, 